Hosting here, thanks. Okay, um, so uh, I know I know you guys. Do you want to go through an introduction of yourselves? Sure, Jim Kennedy. Um, I started working on this issue about six years ago in relationship to the rare earth work I was doing at the national security level and at the economic level. Alex? Uh, I'm just working uh, with the Thermal Energy Alliance and a group in California to promote education in the general public for molten salt reactor, thorium, cycle, that kind of thing so that people will actually know something if it ever comes out in the press in any way so that they have to read it and say, what is this? Now, they'll at least know something. Alex is also kind of like the liaison to the environmental groups. He's got a, a, a lot of experience there where sometimes from where I stand from the mining industry, we don't really have that touchy-feely with the environmental groups, you know. It takes somebody like Alex to kind of liaison that or help transition those kinds of concepts or moderate our message so that it makes sense. Yeah, so they make more enemies in the Sierra Club and That's NRC right. than he does because they don't talk to him at all. That's right. <laughs> How did I even get involved in this? I was dealing with the mining issue and a, a value chain issue for the most valuable elements on the periodic table. You know, uh, all the recording devices you're using, satellites, uh, weapons, weapons, every guided yeah. ordinance there is, interrogating lasers. Everything that we use in a modern technology that's part of a high-value economy, it's all using these materials. The rare earths. The rare earths. Yeah. And so, you know, here I am. I've got this great deposit, and I look at it, and I say, wow, this is a home run. I'm in great shape. Now, where do I take this stuff? Who's next in the value chain? And after spending a few months studying it, I realized there is no value chain in the United States. That entire value chain was picked up and physically moved to China. And so I thought to myself, if we don't have a value chain in this country for these materials, these rare earth materials, we can't make iPhones. We can't make high definition televisions. We can't even make, you know, the the components that are part of our defense system for our military. So we have to have these systems here. Why don't we? And then evaluating the, the winning and losing um, uh, characteristics of various rare earth reserve deposits, I quickly discovered that the stumbling block was always thorium. Thorium was always this problem, this liability that was associated with rare earths. They're abundant, they're everywhere. We're throwing them away. Why are we throwing them away? Because we don't know what to do with the thorium. So I show up at the first conference and I'm like, Hey, you guys, who wants my thorium, basically? And all of a sudden, they were looking at where do we get thorium? Can you mine it? Is it abundant? Is it available? And, and we started, I started working on this together. So my, you know, I originally started out looking at how I could integrate what I had into a U.S. value chain and then quickly discovered that, that my rare earth contribution is, is important but the bigger contribution is how we can actually make safe, clean energy. What, okay, so have you heard that Apple's gonna be manufacturing their new Macs in the United States? They may be assembling them, but in the end, the components are going to be made where the materials come from. And if you wanna build a screen with high resolution color, you have to build that screen in China. So the manufacturing is going to happen in China because it's the only place they can get a guaranteed supply of europium and all of the other doping agents of rare earths that are critical. So yeah, they'll be assembling stuff here and we'll all feel better, but the real value adding and the real manufacturing will occur in China until we can guarantee that company that we can supply them in a... a uh, constant flow, undisturbed, of those materials at the quality they need. And we're nowhere near that in the United States. Why aren't we producing those materials in the United States? Well, historically, the United States and the French were the leading countries in the world in developing rare earth elements into high quality oxides, into metals, and then into alloys. 1986, the Chinese government 
formed an industrial policy that said they were going to take over the world's supply and value chain of rare earths and they were going to dominate this. And they ran prices down so low that they put every single producer of rare earths out of business in the entire world. And then as they moved up the value chain, they basically eliminated all the people that provided the value added. So that now, if you want to build a, um, any high-tech uh, electronic equipment or uh, energy savings devices or green technologies, not only do the resources come from China, but all of the, the specialized chemical or metallurgical uh, components are from China. And you can't say, hey, I'd like to buy some, some uh, dysprosium, send it to uh, you know, Oak, Ridge, Oak Ridge or you know, La Jolla, California, we're going to build these things. They won't do it. They say, if you want a guaranteed supply of this dysprosium, you will move your entire factory here and you will hand us your IP and you will hand us all of your patents and we'll be able to duplicate your work. In the United States, a company called Mountain Pass uh, reopened. It was the last rare earth mine outside of China to collapse and fail. China never put them out of pr uh, business based on price. They actually had a tailings lake, a tailings pipe spill, and they dumped some thorium out into a desert. Somebody ran by in California with a Geiger counter and said, oh my God, mm -hmm. this is radioactive. They shut the whole thing down and the entire U.S. effort and presence in rare earths was gone. So now, today, Mali Corp has raised $2 billion and they're, they're reopening and they're going to challenge the Chinese. So they reopened this, this mine that isn't known for having the best uh, distribution of rare earths. They reopened a mine that's known for having the smallest amount of thorium mixed in with their rare earths. It's called a bastnasite deposit or a carbonatite. So now what they're doing is, is they're mining materials. There's, uh, you know, out of the 17 rare earths, they're only getting about six or seven of them in commercial levels because when you get rid of the thorium, you get rid of the heavies. And when you don't have the heavies, there's so many things that you can't actually produce on the high tech side. So here's the problem. They spent about $600 million reopening a mine. 92% of what they pull out of the ground is waste. 8% is rare earths. Of that 8% that's rare earths, they only have about half of them. And they have to, they have to defeat China commercially. China doesn't need to make a profit. China owns the entire value chain. So guess what Molycorp's now doing? Sending most of its rare earths to China for processing. That's because a Canadian company bought the rights to them, uh, right? Well, uh, Because the Chinese wanted to buy Mountain Pass, but our government wouldn't let them. Yes. So they went to Canada instead, and then a Canadian company took over the rights According to According to the Corp. press releases, right. this is different, but in effect, it's a very interesting reverse merger. Right. The Chinese actually tried to buy Chevron, which controlled this deposit. And some folks stood up in Congress and said, hey, no, no, that's a bad idea. So the Chinese backed away. And, in, and what they did do is they ended up funding a company called Neo Materials, which owns a number of rare earth refineries inside China. And so Itty Bitty Molly Corp bought great big Neo Materials. And Neo Materials said, hey, give us all these higher value rare earths and we'll send them to our friends back in China and they'll actually make the high value products. So what we have in the US is a $2 billion effort to mine rare earths and the only ones that are staying here and are getting processed here are kind of like the low tech, low value ones that are used for glass polishing or um, you know, uh, catalyst crackers. And those are important but those aren't necessarily the things that put satellites in deep space. Those aren't the things that uh, assure that our U.S. military has good targeting systems. Those aren't the things that make the next Motorola handset the best Motorola handset the world can build. So what happened is Molly Corp was swallowed by the monopoly. And, and the way they've structured the monopoly Almost no one can do it on a go-it-alone go it basis. So 
when I finally started working with the Thorium Energy Alliance, I said, hey guys, there's so much rare earths that we're throwing away because of thorium, and, it's mo and this stuff, this material we can capture is actually part of some other commodity stream. So, you know, where they're producing phosphates for fertilizers, they're producing about two times what the United States needs every year in rare earths, and they're dumping them because of these actinide contaminants. This is true for the heavy mineral sands mining business, who's throwing away at least 100% of what our country needs every single year because of the thorium contamination. So, you know, for, for let's say, some of uh, Alex's friends over there in the Sierra Club who are against mining, this is great news for you because we can solve the rare earth problem without opening any new mines, and we can solve the energy problem without mining either. Yeah, except, except that the Sierra Club policy on nuclear is so foolish and naive that uh, some of us who are club members are trying to get it reevaluated through the board, but uh, it's, it's a real uphill slog. They don't want to admit anything is wrong with their policy against nuclear. What sort of efforts have you tried with Vitek and this year? Uh, I actually visited the club club's headquarters in San Francisco uh, last year to del hand deliver uh, letters to board members when they're having their board meeting and to the director, Bruin. Uh, the problem is that there's a small group of people who are just blanketly anti-nuclear uh, who got control of the policy that the club has after 1986. It's sort of like, it, it, their policies are sort of like the NRA policies is in 1986 Sierra Club directorship and policy setting switched from pro-nuclear because of the right reasons low environmental impact to anti-nuclear because of Chernobyl, which is unrelated. And like the NRA in 77 or 76 got taken over by these crazies who now run it. Maybe talk about public misconceptions about uh, radiation. Well, most people are afraid of the word radiation and the word nuclear because it's associated with bombs and that kind of thing. They don't aren't really well educated. The, the French have done a great job in, that, in educating the public about their nuclear power operations and so as a result they aren't against nuclear power in France. There are misconceptions and some of them I think are malicious and some are you know uh, aren't are malicious so for example if you look at the comic books from the 50s uh, or you know the, the horror movies that came out of that atomic age you know, radiation made us all giants, right? And right. or we morphed into giant spiders. Who know? But uh, and I think that's a lingering fear that people can't get over. But there's also a commercial fear, which is if I'm coal or I'm wind or I'm natural gas, every dollar that nuclear can make is a dollar that, that comes oh, away yeah. from me. Right. In so, fact, that, that's in that's in the previous video that uh, Gordon made, Thorium Remix 2011, it shows about two hours in who was sponsoring the ads against the Shoreham nuclear plant on Long Island, and it was the Heating Oil Institute. Sure, so, so <laughs> yes. this is it. So they, the guy who's sitting there with like a green t-shirt on, right. chained to a tree, right. doesn't realize he may actually be working for coal. Exactly. Or he may be working for natural gas. Yeah, exactly. And so. You, and, and if you use the EPA figures for deaths caused by, caused by combustion, in particular coal emissions, uh, you can actually assign to the protesters that succeeded in shutting down nuclear plants, you can s assign a certain number of years of lives lost in their fellow Americans by their activity. So, right. and in fact, our own Sierra Club has facilitated killing or making sick Americans by increasing the amount of coal combustion that had to be done to make up for the Shoreham plant, for instance. Okay, that was fun. Do you have to interact with people, uh, with people directly and sort of um, through minds about the dangers of various uh, waste byproducts? Uh, like, No, no. This is interesting. So, 
in the mining industry, the government, uh, the expanding America in the early 1800s was very generous to mining companies because the only way that we could create that wealth of our nation was to mine for valuable materials and specifically gold, gold and silver. So the mining laws that are still on the books from the 1800s are extremely generous in terms of prospecting, uh, granting land. And then when it comes to waste, um, I don't want to say anything bad about the industry. I work in the industry, but they've created rules inside that industry that as long as it's not nuclear, you can manage those things inside a regulatory environment with very little input from the outside. So, for example, the mine uh, that, that I'm associated with was an iron ore mine for 40 years. And they would pull out the iron ore, and they'd pull out this phosphorus that turned out to have rare earth in it. And the rare earth tended to have a little bit of thorium in it. And because the phosphates uh, had a bunch of iron they couldn't break away cheaply, they decided they weren't even going to sell the phosphate um, for fertilizer. So for 40 years, they just dumped this stuff into a tailings lake. So they were dumping uh, the, the waste byproducts of iron ore mining, which is a lot of silica, a lot of calcium, a reasonable amount of sulfur, uh, the phosphates, the rare earths, and the thorium. And they, they meet and comply with the regulations. And so the outside world isn't really very aware of what's going on there. And that's how mining really works. Uh, now, if you took that to a coal facility and you looked at what's in their tailings lakes, it's pretty nasty stuff. Once again, the government deems this important enough and they create some kind of a bubble and they just say, it's all here, we know where it's at, and we're gonna figure out how to clean it up later. Or we've got a theory that we'll just cover it and get something to grow on and it'll disappear. So, no, you really don't have to deal with the public. So that's why the companies that are mining phosphates or they're mining iron ore or they're mining um, heavy mineral sands like titanium or zirconium, they're just taking the, the beautiful rare earth monazites with thorium and they're throwing it right back where they got it, throwing it right back on the ground. And by mining laws, that's legal. By mining laws, they've done nothing wrong. But what they've actually done is they've, they've boosted the concentration of thorium right there, right? The thorium's natural, it was there anyway, anyway, but they took out everything they wanted and threw everything else back in there. On a global basis, there's probably two million tons of rare earths easily accessible in tailings lakes. The value of that is an unbelievably astronomical number. Basically, multiply that times a thousand and then multiply that times 50. That's how much money they've thrown away because they think that if they separate it and they throw just the thorium back, they've now got a legal liability they can't deal with. When they throw it away in its natural state of monazite, it's called monazite, it's A-OK. -okay. If they took the rare earths out, all that's left is the thorium. Now they're throwing thorium on the ground. That's not gonna work. So, so inside industries, people don't see the way waste is handled and why waste streams aren't pursued until they became valuable product streams. And a lot of that is, of course, the cost of energy. Yeah. And that's one of the things we hope to solve here. Right. Any element that's naturally radioactive, bismuth is the heaviest non-radioactive element. So any naturally radioactive element is controlled by AEC rules from way back uh, under the Atomic Energy Act. Right. So the problem is that thorium is not very radioactive per pound or per whatever because its half-life is 14 billion years. In other words, half the thorium ever created in the universe is still here. But it's, it does have some radioactivity and it does decay through a chain that includes radium and radon. And so as a result of that, it's controlled in a special way different from other mineral uh, or, or other chemicals, other minerals and chemicals. So as a result, 
mountain pass mine, for instance, when it had that small amount of thorium escape into a creek or something and get into the desert, they were suddenly liable for trying to rectify this or clean this up under the Atomic Energy Commission rules. And I know what the Sierra Club, my Sierra Club, got involved with that suit too. So the whole thing kind of blew up because, oh, all of a sudden there's this radioactive material that's escaped into the non-mining environment, right? So not looking at the facts that, well, the thorium can, can certainly be mostly cleaned up and it's naturally there anyway, so really why worry so much about it? I mean, the Germans were using it in toothpaste years ago and yeah. one German, uh, German army officer was getting all the thorium he could at the end of World War II and taking it back to Germany because he was going, going to go into the cosmetics business, put the thorium in it. That natural glow. And gives you a natural glow from the radium that gradually appears as the thorium decays. This was common idea then, and thorium oxide was a good abrasive and, and a very, very uh, high melting point chemical that could be used to make gasoline lantern uh, elements, the mantles in like a Coleman gas lantern. So all these uses of thorium have been around for many, many years. The problem is we classify it as a dangerous material, sort of like highly, more highly radioactive substances like uranium-235 and so forth. It really needs to be corrected. So the Atomic Energy Act of 1950s or whatever it was really needs to actually have some congressional co correction so that this liability for the miners of rare earth goes away in some, some way, some mechanism like the rare earth cooperative that would separate the thorium from the rare earth and have the thorium stored under the co cooperatives aegis and the rare earths distributed to those companies who, are, who want to process them. Right. So, to, to be specific, you actually have to separate the rare earth refinery from the liability of thorium. Right. Because if you want the Japanese and the Koreans and Hitachi and right. GM and Siemens to invest in this, they will not put a dollar into this facility until right. they know that, that, that somebody's not going to come back on them on that thorium liability years later and go, hey, there's a $30 billion cleanup. So nobody will touch it. The defense industry doesn't even want to be associated with this cooperative if you can't make that liability go away. Right. And what is the liability? The liability is really just a misconception of risk. So to put things in perspective, as Alex was saying, we used to make a lot of great things out of thorium. In fact, uh, super high structural steel in aircraft was something called uh, Thormag. And so they'd have Thormag components in experimental aircraft or supersonic aircraft, and uh, they were super light and super strong. And so a pilot flying at 100,000 uh, feet is sitting underneath a little plastic dome that's the equivalent of being in a microwave on high for, t you know. And when this whole craziness of zero tolerance of, of radiation came by, nobody said one's different than the other. They said radiation's radiation. It's all deadly. So they actually went into museum piece aircraft and removed these components that were doing nothing. Now, a pilot was sitting in a seat being baked alive like he's in a microwave, and that, that metal strut is 15 feet behind him, and it's doing nothing. So this is the, the disproportionality of perceived risk. And, and, and the public, I don't think, is ever going to get their head around it. So John and I said, rather than fight that fight, why don't we just say, hey, we're going to put it into a bank, like a thorium bank. We're going to sequester. It's the new word in DC, right? We're going to sequester all of this stuff. We're going to account for every single gram. We're going to store it in a facility, and we're going to let Sierra Club guys come out and take all their Geiger counters and run around the building as many times as they want and try to find any, um, uh, any, any evidence that there's emissions. We can, we can, that's a low threshold, low engineering thing to do. We can get there. I don't think we're going to educate the public and they're going to go, some radiation's good, some's bad. But if we can say to them, we're putting it all there, you know where it's at, it's safe, and then this industry can get back off the ground, that's our goal, and, and we think that's doable. We think educating the public 
on something with 50 years of instilled fear is, is just too much. It's a bureaucratic thing, really. I mean, it, it, when, when those regulations were set up, it were, it, no one really thought every, every uh, implication out. So keeping the same regulations over the years has simply been the way bureaucracies proceed. So it's really hard to overcome established bureaucratic rules. It's just like the level of radiation that's safe set by the UN and the National Academy of Sciences in 1946 or 47. It, it wasn't really based upon studies and facts. It was just based upon what at that moment in time seemed to be sensible or enforceable and it's taken over 60 years for some of those mistakes that were made in regulating radiation exposure to be corrected. And just this last year, the United Nations uh, did in fact correct some of their uh, estimates of dangers of radiation and their rules for exposure. But it, 60 years is a long time to wait for something to become realistic. Right. And right. now it hasn't even, it hasn't percolated into the, the public and right. there will be groups in the public that will push back. Yeah. You know, I mean, remember where funding comes from for an environmental cause or an anti-abortion cause or anything else. The, the funding comes from essentially getting people excited. And you're, you typically don't excite people very much with the truth or facts. But if you can embellish them and you can mix them with a certain amount of fear, you've got a money machine. And so if you look at the way our politics even works in the United States, if you watch a certain uh, uh, television show programs, I mean, really they're all about uh, bad information, uh, uh, non-factual information, but information that's calculated to, get to, to extract an emotional response. So. So, so the UN says, okay, we were wrong. And then all of a sudden, you know, Alex's buddies in, in California go, change thresholds never. I mean, that's, that's another 60 years. So our approach to this is, are you afraid of this? Okay, we're going to put it right over here. We're going to cover it up. It's going to be safe. It's locked. We've got it taken care of. Let's get on with our lives. You know? And and, and don't, don't spend much time in your man cave in the basement because it, there's a lot of radon coming in from the rocks and the natural uh, earth around the basement and, and the concrete uh, material. So, you know, really, if you're worried about radiation, don't go down in your basement much. Well, Alex is on to something. <laughs> this is, you know, we, we just, we refuse to like grow up, get wise, I don't know what it is. The, the planet's a radioactive planet, right? Life couldn't have start, would not have begun without radiation. Radiation was the stimulus for life. And if you took, if you went back three billion years on this planet, the level of radiation was about three times higher than it currently is. And there, uh, there was a lot more um, U-235 than natural uranium. It was just a much more radioactive place. And, and, you know, so what do we deal with in life that, that stems from natural radiation? Well, the helium crisis that we're suffering in America, you know, uh, Hank Johnson's speech, nobody realized he was joking, but, you know, what happens when we can't blow up kids' balloons? He's right. Here we are panicking about this helium shortage. All of the helium on the planet, in our atmosphere, it all comes from the natural decay of radioactive products. All of the lead in every car battery, all of the lead that we use in everything in life is at the end of the decay chain of radioactive materials. Bananas have potassium in it. Potassium has a radioactive isotope. We need it. Our body needs it. Um, you know, so everybody, every person is, is a little bit radioactive. It's part of life. Yeah, actually quite a bit. I'm sensing your 4,400 decays per second there <laughs> from your potassium. Well, a lot of it's the humidity. you think we might get rain down pretty soon? Yeah, we'll move quick a bit, guys. So, I think one of the most uh, impressive things I've ever had somebody just step forward and say that hit me like a slap in the face is when Alex would speak about it's not global warming that's going to kill us. It's it's changing the pH level in the oceans and ending our food chain. So if you could ask him, you something. ask him. So so Alex, <laughs> um, 
it was, I think, the second uh, the Thorium conference, or maybe the third, when you put up that, that graph that showed all of the, the earliest stages of, of uh, plant life and animal life in the sea, and you said, I don't care if you don't believe in global warming because that's not what's going to kill us. I think that's it's one of the most compelling messages, and I think it, that's a message that people need to grab a hold of. Right. Well, I include that in every talk I give, regardless of the subject, including today's talk, uh, is that the carbon cycle is what has been trashed by a factor uh, of about 1,500 total. So our debt, our debt to the natural sequestration of carbon from fossil carbon that we've been burning uh, is about 1,500 years. And the reason for that is that there's over 500 billion tons of that unnaturally injected carbon in the atmosphere and oceans. And the natural sequestration cycle that starts with plankton and bones of small uh, animals that live in the sea that cycle builds limestone on the floor of the ocean, and that's where the carbon ends up when, it, when it's uh, no longer in the living animals. So if you shut that down, that's a very serious problem because now the ocean will continually change chemically and to the point where this cycle won't work, and not only won't that cycle work to get rid of the carbon in the ocean, but uh, you'll shut down the food chain because those plants and animals that are tiny, microscopic, are the source for all the fish in the sea, except perhaps for jellyfish and that kind of thing. So if you want to eat jellyfish for the, in the future, keep going the way we're going, but that 500 billion tons has to be gotten rid of somehow. And the natural cycle only gets rid of 0.3 billion tons per year. So that's why you can figure on 1,500 years of serious problems, even if you stop burning all hydrocarbons today. Even if every hydrocarbon burning system that we have was shut down this moment, we would still have to figure out how to offset the problem of those 500 billion tons of carbon unnaturally in the air and ocean because the air will continue to dissolve the carbon dioxide in the ocean where it will change the acidity of the ocean to a point where now the food chain can't function anymore. And we're only about a decade or two away from that. So like the, the sea animals can't precipitate out the calcium right. to make their skeleton the chemistry because the chemistry is different. There's a book called, we're off camera, there's a book called Oxygen. I was hoping you could maybe talk a little bit and, and theorize uh, what uh, 50 years from now would look like if we continue on the path we're on today. So the year 2063, I guess, what, what, what's Earth going to look like if we continue right now? Well, I don't know if, if, if you don't, if we don't really quickly reduce the amount of carbon dioxide emitted, uh, we're going to end up with uh, a few billion people losing food. I mean, that's, that's going to be that simple. Now, I don't know, I don't know what you, what we should imagine will happen with as that occurs, because it will happen gradually. Very gradually. Over the next maybe 20 years, it'll start happening and be more evident. Right. As again, somebody mentioned, we are, we wait till tragedies occur before we actually do something. But uh, Alex, as you pointed out earlier, you know, uh, when we push the uh, the oceans to a sterile environment because we create change the pH and the small, uh, the, you know, the beginning of the food chain can't form skeletons right. or can't pull the nutrients out of the sea to be, to, to, to sustain life. Watch out behind you. Uh, even when we figure out that that problem has occurred, there's no reverse for that. Right. There's no, that, that thing is too big to put in reverse. So it'll be too late to respond. It, it's basically game over and a slow game of starvation and the world will get really ugly. You know, it always, it always kind of, uh, gnaws me uh, that these, you know, the people that believe themselves, that preach the loudest that they're an environmentalist, say they're against this and they're against that and we shouldn't use this and we shouldn't use that. If they want to see environmental depredation, right, yeah. they need to go back and look at what happened during the Depression when people had to uh, scavenge food from the natural environment and human beings are w have way out past, uh, past our normal carrying capacity. 
we basically nearly uh, uh, rendered multiple species extinct so we could feed ourselves and our family. And who's going to say to somebody, you can't kill the last squirrel to feed your child? But yeah. that's basically what will happen. We'll, we, that is the worst form of environmental depredation you can ever have. So if you're an environmentalist, you need to get on board with this. You need to get on board with right. alternative, safe, sustainable energy. Yeah, there are two, two things that have to happen quickly. Con conversion of our energy system to something that is, in fact, non-emitting. That can't happen as quickly as necessary, however. So the other thing that has to happen is somebody has to figure out how to deal with the ocean pH issue. And if it requires doing something like dumping uh, calcium oxide from every ship that, that's allowed to uh, enter a port uh, in the United States or Europe or anywhere as they travel across the seas, then so be it. But the point is that that has to be dealt with quickly.